Welcome to the 3030 Health Podcast. The following discussion is for education and entertainment. It is not intended to diagnose or treat disease. Please do not apply any of this information without first discussing it with your doctor. Here is your host, Dr. Ruiz. Hello, everyone. Super excited for today's episode. Today, we have another Q&A episode where we cover different topics like the healthcare system and paleo effects. But before we start, here's a word from our sponsors. I hope you enjoy the show. Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here with you. I'd love to take just a moment and tell you about our Thyroid Advisor program. So what is a thyroid advisor visit? Well, imagine that one of your closest friends happened to be a thyroid doctor and that they understood the conventional, the naturopathic, and all the functional approaches. You know, they just wanted you to feel better and they were happy to video chat whenever you needed them. So that's basically it. Just click the link to set up a time and the IH docs are happy to help out today. Hey guys, you know, super excited to be here after a brief hiatus, really cool time spent in Austin. I know we haven't released a podcast in a couple of weeks, but you know, we're back and hopefully we can bring some really cool content in the coming weeks. I'm here with my friend, Adam Sadowski. Adam, how are you, man? Oh, Dr. Ruiz, I'm doing great. I just want to first do a shout out to all the students that matched for the residency program for the, the graduating students. So congratulations to all of you uh, hardworking students. And yeah, a lot's been happening since, since the last podcast. And you know, there's second to last episode of Game of Thrones and school's just kind of going crazy. And, and yeah. Studies were released. Uh, conferences were attended. Uh, friendships were rekindled. Uh, it, it, it's, been, it's been a cool month, man. Oh yeah, absolutely. The study that I've been talking about uh, in recent weeks, in the past episodes that I've been on your podcast, we've been talking about the autoimmune paleo diet that Rob, uh, Dr. Rob Abbott and I are working on, and uh, we finally got published, so that's really exciting. And I think that we've actually got, you know, something in the works, so we'll be talking about that in the future. Yeah, you know, and, and I really want to touch on it, and I'm, and we're not going to delve too, uh, too deeply into it because I actually have an interview with Rob and you, uh, maybe Angie uh, will, will join us you know, in, in the very near future. So we, we're going to dig deep, but, uh, but I do want to say a couple of things about that. But yeah, so uh, just came back from Austin, had an awesome time at Paleo FX, hung out with some really cool people. Uh, I was part of a couple of panels and I did my own presentation and, you know, really well received, uh, hung out with the Keto Gains crew, you know, uh, it, it was just uh, an amazing time and really the future of this health trends and and the uh, the patients taking care and being responsible for their own care is just fascinating and it's just amazing and it makes me really happy about the profession that I chose and the people that that support me it's just so cool yeah I think what's really cool is that now that with all this access to you know health information patients can kind of do their own research and, and you know learn about you know, what's going on with their conditions and, and can kind of address it to their doctor. So, you know, there's more control uh, with the patient. So being in a professional where we spend more time with our patients is really a huge benefit for us because we get to kind of talk with our patients a little bit more and, and have more focus with them so this way they leave kind of feeling a little bit more confident in what's going on. So, uh, Dr. Ruiz, what was your presentation at PFX about? We did a little bit of like myth busting when it comes to thyroid and Hashimoto's thyroiditis specifically and how to find and achieve good hypothyroid management. So we went deep into uh, what reverse T3 is. We went deep into how to manage your thyroid and spoiler alert, it's not through measuring your uh, temperature or looking at your free T3 levels or your reverse T3. T3 levels. I did a big article this past February for NDNR, and I'll link to it. In this article, I make a very strong argument about how doctors need to still use your TSH to guide your progress. And the coolest thing was after the presentation, you know, I had a line of people line up and asking me questions. And over and over, you would hear these stories about, yeah, you know, I went to my functional medicine doctor and 
they told me, oh, your reverse T3 was elevated and your T3 is, su- is super low. So we need to, you know, just give you a bunch of uh, Cytomel or T3. And the patients were like, you know, I still feel like crap. And after listening to my presentation, you know, a lot of light bulbs went off. And we started talking about how to reverse those symptoms and how to change things a little bit, not not be overly aggressive, and actually find some answers for the under, underlying cause of your symptoms. Dr. Michael Ruscio has been talking about this for a while too, about how the truth lies somewhere in the middle and how within the functional medicine practitioner world, we sometimes kind of like turn our back to the conventional model too much and the conventional model just rolls their eyes whenever they see some functional medicine or some different approach to how the healthcare of a person or how Hashimoto's should be treated. And in unfortunately, a lot of people are getting left behind. And people are suffering with, you know, uh, palpitations or hair loss or extreme fatigue, even after they have started hypothyroid treatment. I I think the PFX uh, lectures are going to be available online soon. Uh, So, you know, I highly recommend you guys checking them out because there was a lot of truth bombs that were dropped during the conference. Interestingly, you know, I had a couple of panels. Uh, I did a panel on men's masculinity and health. I did a panel on the biomarkers to track. And I did a panel on the state of healthcare. And that was a very interesting panel because uh, the frustration from, from the people in attendance about not being able to A, get the healthcare that they deserve, and B, not being able to get healthier with the current state of healthcare. And one of the things that resonated like greatly is that, uh, you know, you, you go hang out and, and you see old friends and people that have been, you know, you've met at conferences. And uh, one of my friends reached out to me and uh, she was telling me that her grandma has been uh, suffering with hyponatremia. She's, she's, she's older and uh, she also has Hashimoto's. I was like, well, you know, Hashimoto's thyroiditis and uh, your electrolyte imbalance kind of go hand in hand because of ADH. The HPA axis controls not only your thyroid, but controls your adrenals, your female hormones. And if your adrenals are uh, not working properly because of signaling from the pituitary, you are more prone to kind of lose more electrolytes and simply feel like crap. And this is like really well documented in the literature. This is not like some, you know, in vitro rat model thing. No, it's it's within the conventional model of medicine. There is an association between uh, haponatremia and Hashimoto's. And one of the symptoms for Hashimoto's is hyponatremia, even in the absence of thyroid antibodies. So, so, you know, so you, we were having this conversation, you know, and I'm like, well, you know, just go to, go back to the doctor, you know, propose this, maybe, you know, uh, this could be something. So she dug out lab results from like four or five years and her grandma's TSH levels were, I want to say all over the place, but in a very narrow spectrum. So she would go from like a 0.36 to a 1.5 to a 1.4 back to a 0.4, you know, but but it was like within, you know, uh, you know, it, always below 2, okay? And during her last TSH checkup, her TSH was at a 4 point something, like a 4.3. So two years ago, she was tested. She was like, you know, and I'm making up numbers. Uh, You know, she was, let's say, at a 1.6, okay? And she was fine, you know, and all of a sudden she had a scare. She ended up in the hospital with dehydration and hyponatremia, and she was feeling pretty crappy. And they tested her TSH at that point, and her TSH was like a 4.6. And I'm like, 
you know, this is maybe something that could be interesting in following. Because if she is not able to retain sodium, okay, she's not able to activate sodium pumps, and she's not able to maintain this hydration status, of course you're going to feel crappy. And we have a really clear indication that when those TSH levels were within that spectrum or that narrow margin, she didn't have this hyponatremia problem. So she goes to the to the doctor. You know, don't, they don't have access to uh, to functional medicine or cash based medicine or whatever. And the practitioner is like, no, it's not that. You know, that's within the normal range. And I just want to pull my hair. You know, I just want to scream and just, you know, what the hell, dude? You know, I've said this before, you know, we can use science and we can use this evidence-based model to help people and advance the movement. Or we can use it as a battering club just to squash ideas that are from outside the perspective of the practitioner. Again, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. You know, I'm not advocating that a 98-year-old woman should go on Cytomel and try to, you know, suppress reverse T3 and get those T3 levels super high. You know, I'm not advocating that at all because that's dangerous. You know, you can you can create palpitations and irreversible heart damage. You can predispose her to osteoporosis. You can seriously give her a heart attack, okay? Anxiety, you know, all of those nasty things that come with over-medication. But I am also, as a practitioner, I think, you know, maybe increasing her thyroid medication from, you know, 100 micrograms to 113 micrograms and see if that little bump in TSH allows her to uh, retain some of her sodium and maybe feel a little bit better. I don't think that's completely crazy. I don't think that this is ludicrous. And I think that close monitoring of that relationship would be super important and in a way advocating for the health of someone that is not doing really well. And right now, you know, she she doesn't feel well, so she has someone that is pretty damn savvy when it comes to healthcare. You know, she's been in the business and and in this environment for a very long time, and she understands uh, about you know maybe the reference ranges are not the best, and maybe uh, maybe the uh, the system doesn't work. And advocating a solid diet and advocating for good circadian rhythm and all that, and she. As a person that is very connected within the paleo community and this different way of accessing healthcare cannot get help. And that is just fucked up. You know, when we have a lot of work to do, Adam, and we really have to get out there and continue making more naturopaths that are that are, that are good practitioners and more functional medicines and work with health coaches and continue advocating for good practices in farming and paleo diets or nutrient dense diets and good circadian rhythm. Because even our people, our tribe right now, they are suffering. You guys experienced a little bit of this when you guys released your paper. Do you want to talk a little bit about, like, the pushback that you guys received? Uh, yeah, so some of the pushback we got was kind of from and Dr. Ruiz is talking about the paper that Dr. Rob Abbott and I published where we used the autoimmune paleo protocol, and we were just testing efficacy and even just, you know, applying that diet and sort of lifestyle treatment for people with Hashimoto's. And just some people who were criticizing our paper based on sort of the numerous confounding variables and sort of statistical models that we used in our paper without kind of understanding why we chose the way we set up our study and sort of the statistical models or the way we were tracking our statistics was used. So our main outcome was a very subjective scale known as the SF36. And what that does is it measures sort of somebody essentially their their quality of life, but it's from a it's from the patient's perspective. So there's an entire, you know, subjectivity to that in that, you know, one day you might feel down and then another day you might feel great and then another day you might feel terrible and another day you might be great. So perhaps on that day that we were gave the 
the questionnaire that day they were really good or that day they were really bad. You know, it's not an objective marker that you can measure, such as something like weight or something like a blood test result, because on our study, there weren't really any sort of significant changes when it came to measuring thyroid lab. And for some people, they thought that, oh, you didn't change the thyroid marker, then why even bother engaging in these lifestyle changes? So let's let's translate this for our audience. So basically, a lot of people were pissed off or 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 criticizing uh, the study because uh, the questionnaire was given at random, and one day those patients would have felt great, and maybe they got it that day, and that's when they answered, and maybe the sun was shining that day, and they didn't get a questionnaire the day that it was raining, or they didn't get the questionnaire when the day after they got laid. You know, it doesn't matter. But this is not like the end all, you know, meta analysis of is AIP a way of treating Hashimoto's. This is how science works. You do an observation. You you see something in nature or in the lab or whatever. You create a hypothesis. You test that hypothesis, and then eventually, after meta-analysis and, and years and years and, and millions and millions of dollars of money spent, then you can have your answer. And unfortunately, humans, we are really random. You know, we're not controlled environments. We're not robots. Where Dr. Strickland kept saying this. If we were machines, if we were robots, and you injected some code, we can predict the outcome of that code. In humans, you can inject the code, i.e., you know, going vegan or uh, going AIP, and you don't know what the outcome is going to be because we are genetic soup that, that might have different outcomes. But guess what? You have to start somewhere. And in the case of this very small study, you know, whatever, it's a good observation. Angie Alt and Mickey Trescott have been helping people, guiding them to an autoimmune paleo protocol, and these people gush and rave about the way they have improved. So you have this N of a thousand people that were, you know, more than that that have been helped by this autoimmune protocol. Enter Rob and you and Angie and you guys you guys are like, you know what? Maybe we should quantify this and maybe we should try to see if this, you know, helps with the autoimmune thyroid disease. You make a pilot study to see if it's even plausible. You know, you go through it, you get some pretty cool results. Then, you know, we pass the hat around and we try to collect money and we try to, you know, raise funds and then we make a bigger trial that is controlled for all the things and, and then bigger and bigger. And after a while, then maybe we will have the answer if the AIP should be a consideration for treating people with autoimmune thyroid disease. You know, that's how science works. Yeah. If you even just kind of look at our basic setup of our study, it's what's called a pilot study. And the whole point of a pilot study is kind of to see if the way we're set up our study is even possible to continue in the future. Because you don't want to get all this money, say millions of dollars, to conduct a trial if the way you set up your trial isn't even set up properly and is going to fail miserably. So, you know, we just did a very small trial to kind of see in future trials that we want to work on where we're going to iron out any of the wrinkles. As an evidence-based practitioner, as someone that, that values research and my protocols are deeply grounded in the literature, it kind of is funny that, you know, some keyboard warriors get behind their computer and they start, you know, like poking holes into something that really isn't necessary. We don't, we all understand that this is just the beginning steps of something, that something that gives plausibility. But like, seriously, do you really need a meta-analysis, a double-blind placebo-controlled test, a multi-generational study over 50 countries, do you really need that to just clean up your diet for 30 days and see if you feel better afterwards? It's not like it's not like a new drug. It's not like you're going to inject someone with like helium or something like that. You know, it's like, okay, listen, guys, we have X number of participants they did a you know an autoimmune paleo protocol, and after six weeks they feel better. I don't know. It sounds pretty crazy to me. <laughs> like so, like what's 
Could could there be harm? Maybe, you know, maybe. But eat clean, you know, avoid a couple of things for 30 days, try to reintroduce them afterwards, and maybe you'll feel better. I don't think it's that fucking crazy. <laughs> well put. But it's not the highest level of evidence, and that is truth. And, and that's where it gets really confusing, okay? Because, yeah, this is not the highest level of evidence. This is not something outrageous that proves that the AIP protocol cures uh, Hashimoto's. Right. You can't go shouting off of the rooftops and say, you know, this needs to be applied to everybody. Yeah. But at the same time, is it really that crazy? And, and, and yeah, you know, I guess people might um, – I, you know, I might get a lot of shit for saying all this because in, in reality, it's not evidence. But we understand that. And how many people have benefited from, you know, going paleo or going vegan or going, you know, and it's just like this simple movement from like heavily processed foods to non-processed foods and they feel better. They get better. Markers, blood markers get better. But, you know, as humans, you know, it's it's very easy to be critical and, you know, one of the worst characteristics in humans, at least to me, is being cynical. I think I've said this before, because when you're cynical, it's just burn the world and nothing matters. But I'm not going to do anything about it. You know, it's just like this uh, very negative outlook of, you know, like, yeah, you're wrong. He's wrong. Everyone's wrong. And that's it. You know, there's no movement forward to try to change or break or advance science or the system or the world. And a lot of people confuse sarcasm with cynicism. Sarcasm is trying to be funny in a very roundabout way. Cynicism is just being negative, okay? And cynicism is not going to cure the system. It's not, uh, cynicism is not going to heal people. Cynicism is not going to fix our healthcare system. Cynicism is not going to help my friend's grandma. And it's very frustrating when we are, you know, as, as a practitioner and presenter and I have a little bit of a following, when my friends are being attacked and misconstrued because they're trying to help. So, it, so it's kind of crazy, you know, hopefully people understand that, that, yeah, we need to follow science 100%, you know, we need to see the evidence and we need to follow the evidence. And if the evidence changes, we need to change with the evidence. It's very important to be open-minded like that as a scientist. But, you know, at some point, we also need to help people and we also need to move the envelope and push that envelope forward and try to just do as much good as we can and not try to, you know, batter and, and beat up people that are trying to do good. So what did you guys come up with as like an ultimate conclusion for the state of healthcare? Where did you see like the future of healthcare? Or did you guys just conclude that basically that everybody has to be open-minded and kind of in it together? You know, there's the, it's an ongoing debate. And I think it's, it's going to be, you know, a mix of like personal responsibility, Okay, education, and then access to healthcare, and then a little bit of like the N equals one model. You know, I, I mentioned you know like there are a lot of studies that say that there's there's a down regulation of thyroid hormone whenever uh, you go on a ketogenic or a lower carb diet. You know that is truth. You know you need insulin to convert T4 into T3. You might lose some electrolytes. You know with ketogenic diets, uh, which is very important as we discussed earlier for thyroid function, and yet. Every Tuesday, the Keto Gains group posts picture after picture after picture of women, 28 to 50, for their Transformation Tuesday. You know, so like that age group is the highest affected by thyroid disease, and they look great. So maybe the guys at Keto Gains with their combination of following results and not following ketones and their protein recommendations and their electrolyte recommendations have figured something out, and we need to look at that, you know. Do I think that everyone should go on keto gains? No. And they would tell you that. What I think is that we look at this social experiment where you have hundreds of thousands of people following this specific eating pattern and they're losing weight, they're getting ripped, they, they feel good, and then identify who it works for and then the people it don't work for, 
just move on to the next thing and not dig their heels thinking that this is the panacea and this and it should work for me too. Uh, you know, I experienced that firsthand with paleo. I do better on a more uh, lower carb kind of diet, but I know that if I don't add carbs at specific points during the week, I kind of feel really crappy. So I do eat some some uh, sweet potatoes, some white rice every once in a while. I uh, refeed. You know, I, I used to be uh, really crazy about fasting and now discover that, you know, I do better, you know, fasting just a couple of days a week, just experimenting, experimenting and experimenting and trying to see what works for you. I hear a lot of people, you know, shit on the paleo concept and the, and and they're like, "Oh, I don't I'm not paleo." And and you ask them what how, how do you eat? And uh they'll say things like, "Oh, I eat, you know, oh, grass-fed beef and I eat I don't eat grains and I eat a lot of vegetables." And I was like, "Well, what the fuck is that then if that's not paleo?" <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so labels kind of uh, you know, people try to uh, go away from labels a lot a lot of times and, you know, uh, so whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it, you know, let's try to identify, you know, what works for you and then go from there. And I'm so sorry for my audience because, like, I'm just ranting over here and I, I just hope this is informational and not just and you just, you know, you just don't uh, took off your headphones and just threw your iPhone across a pond because I, we're just going ham on this podcast. Right. And I think through that. That's kind of hard for a lot of the grass is that for a lot of medicine, it's not black and white and there's a whole bunch of gray. And that gray can be very frustrating for both clinicians and patients alike. There are some specialty tests that have a lot of validity. There are some reference ranges within, you know, your conventional labs that have a lot of validity. A CBC, a chem panel are so important. And then if you want to do some toxic metal testing, you know, or some HPA, uh, you know, circadian rhythm modulation, you know, uh, doing a saliva cortisol can have a lot of application, but it's in the middle, you know, and and, and it's super frustrating for my friends and it's super fr uh, frustrating for uh, my followers and it's super fr frustrating for my loved ones and for me. And we just, you know, one day at a time trying to fight and advocate for people that are sick. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I don't know if we have any more time, but would you be able to talk about the other panels that you're involved in? Totally. Uh, yeah, it's it's not going to be as fun as the, as the healthcare panel. But we talked about biomarkers. Right. Yeah. That was a huge rabbit hole that we could talk about for you know hours on end. Yeah, so so during the the uh, masculinity and uh, uh, panel, you know, it was really cool to see. Uh, you know, I shared a panel with Dr. Strickland and, uh, and Ben Greenfield and myself, uh, Kirk Parsley, and we talked about how it's cool and it's okay to be to be a guy, you know, and and how you know what's more uh, masculine than taking care of yourself so you can take care of others, you know, and how, you know, mentorship and having someone to look up to and having a hero story and sometimes, you know, being able to learn from your mistakes and not, and, you know, it's so ancestral and so, uh, you know, uh, in, intertwined with our DNA and it makes us better people. And the importance of, you know, uh, early prevention and, and being able to control your destiny by not only eating a good diet, not only expressing yourself in whatever which way you want to express yourself, but also by taking care of yourself, you know, going to the doctor and getting some preventive lab tests. You know, uh, there was a, a guy that came up to the mic who had been diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer. That That can be preventable if you test early enough. And if you see like a blip in the system, you know, that can be prevented. And you can, there are things that you can do to prevent prostate cancer. And there are supplements that you can take, you know, in order to be healthier. We spoke at length about, about endocrine disruptors and how the, all these BPAs and all these, you know, uh, estrogenic compounds found in, in our dirty environment bioaccumulate. And how do, doing something like a dim, you know, supplement for 30 days a couple times a year can help your liver get rid of some, some of these estrogenic compounds. My other panel was on biomarkers of health. 
uh, you know, we talked about how sometimes taking your heart rate first thing in the morning or measuring your waist, grip strength, being able to do, uh, you know, 20 push-ups, those are as important as having your uh, your genome mapped out and how all this technology to gamify your health, like R ranks and your, you know, I'm as, as I'm saying this, you know, my Apple Watch, um, they are not going to make you healthy. Sometimes, you know, I, I, you know, I make fun of or I, or I say how rich people like golf because golf is one of those sports that the more you spend, the better you get. And it's not going to be like super good, you know, like you can buy better balls or better clubs or better shoes and, and you know, and you're going to incrementally improve your game. But if you went out there and practiced every day, you probably would save money and improve more. You know, same thing with this, you know, uh, all of these devices that quantify us. They're amazing tools, you know, uh, checking your HRV every morning or checking how many steps you took. My Apple Watch uh, yelling at me every 50 minutes to walk around, you know, and, and not be a lazy ass and, and you know, uh, stand up has improved my health, okay? But buying the Apple Watch didn't improve my, my health. It was the fact that it's changing my habits that improved my health. Could I have bought a kitchen timer and set it for 50 minutes and make myself stand up every 50 minutes? Yeah, I could have, but I'm lazy and I wouldn't have done it. And the Apple Watch is nice. <laughs> so those those um, biomarkers are important and these tools are important. But the most important thing is just being in tuned and quantifying things and changing habits. And that's going to be a bigger change to your health than just buying the next biohacking device and the next biohacking device, you know, and always, always start with introspectively looking at your habits and then uh, go from there. I think it's pretty cool, interesting that you mentioned the push-up because I believe it was either earlier this year or last year, but there was a um, study published by JAMA where I believe they looked at firefighters or ex-firefighters and those who were able to do more push-ups in the cardiologist's office uh, also had uh, reduced risk factors for, I believe, sort of like heart-related death. So I thought that was pretty cool that if they were able to meet a certain threshold that, you know, overall their cardiovascular health is much better. That's exactly why what I was why I, I talked about that. And then there's other there's other biomarkers that you know they're not very fancy, but like grip strength. Yeah, and and all of these are free too. Yeah, all of these are free. And training to get more push ups is not only going to increase your push up capacity, it's going to affect other things, and that's important. And those are biomarkers that you should sometimes you know we forget about for more quantified or or fancy you know uh, biomarkers. But, you know, they are very, very useful. And were these presentations, were they also uh, videos that were posted or are going to be posted? You know, I think they're going to be, uh, they, they have been recorded. And uh, I'm waiting for an announcement for when to, uh, when they're going to be actually posted. And I can't wait because, you know, when you're when you're presenting, you're just running around and talking to people. And I, I still fanboy every time I, uh, someone asks me to take a selfie with me. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, so I can't wait because I, you know, I missed a couple of really cool presentations. You know, uh, there was one on peptides that I'm, uh, I'm really interested in watching, and there was Mike T. Nelson in a presentation. But I was in a panel when he was presenting, so pretty cool stuff in the pipeline. You know, and then next up, AHS, and just super happy and super excited about AHS coming up in August. I have a couple of cool secret projects that involve AHS. And as soon as I'm ready to announce them, I think it's going to be pretty damn cool. I don't even know about them. It must be cool. Yeah, yeah. It's like super secret, man. It's super secret. <laughs> I've been working on this for a couple of years now. And I'll be presenting at AHS. I'm going to be presenting, you know, when uh, what I did at, at Paleo FX was like a, it was more like a patient, you know, education on how to be your own advocate for hypothyroid. My presentation at AHS is going to be a little bit more technical, and I'm going to go deeper into the research about hypothyroidism. So a little bit tougher to chew, but, you know, just full of cool information that I hopefully will be very actionable for both practitioners 
and for people that suffer from thyroid disease. I'm excited to go this year. If anybody's listening and you're going to AHS, don't be shy. Say hi to us. Yeah, definitely, man. And and you know we we're gonna have some uh, some really cool times in in one of my favorite cities, San Diego. Yeah, I'm excited. Well, Adam, how's school? And where's your blog and and your social media right about now? School is going great. I'm in a clinic of some sort four days a week, and uh, you guys can get me on social media at Grips to Lift on Instagram. So S C R I P T T O L I F T. And when are you gonna publish your uh, your website, man? I, I you know I, I I hear people are just like clamoring for it. I know, I know, people are clamoring for it left and right, and and I was trying getting to it last summer, but some things came up, and I'm definitely gonna be getting to it uh, this summer because I'm finishing up school. My last sort of like real um, academic based learning is is done right before the summer starts, so I'm gonna have a bunch of free time then to start getting back on it. Awesome, dude. Any other news? Uh, any any uh, cool uh, uh, things that you've read or anything you want to talk about? Uh, no. That's yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, that's it, man. We're done. We're done. Uh, I'm tired. I'm still recovering from... Oh, man, I got to tell this story. <laughs> One of the craziest things that happened was, you know, I was hanging out with some cool people and I got a ticket for the... Um, charity event which uh, the charity event was to support Sacred Cow and this is a project by Diana Rogers and Rob Wolf and they're making a movie about how sustainable beef is under attack and you know again this is one of the times that as a paleo community or as a whatever community if you're an environmentalist if you are uh, into functional medicine and if you care about where your food comes from you should donate Okay, so uh, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna put up link to the donation site, but yeah, so we, we were at, hanging out, and I was hanging out with Luis and Tyler, and hanging out with Rob, and and you know everyone was there, you know, and just having fun. Uh, uh, there was a little bit of drinking, <laughs> so so then it's time to head home. Okay, and I and I was like, cool. Okay, so I I ordered an Uber. And my phone was low on battery, and I have this battery pack that plugs right into my phone, and I was charging it. And when I went to put it on my uh, my jacket pocket, my phone didn't make it, and it fell to the to the floor of my Uber. Oh no! So I I had some weight on my jacket, thinking that it was my phone, but it was actually the battery pack. So I get home and it's super late, okay? And I have to present the next day. And I'm like, where's my phone? And I start looking everywhere. I go outside and the Uber driver is gone. It's gone. So I log into my computer and I'm like, damn, this guy is going north. The Uber driver was like an hour north of Austin. Um, was he doing like a airport run? No, nope, he just lived there. It was he was done for the night and and he was at home. Oh no! So you know it's like three thirty in the morning. <sighs> he, I, I'm sorry, Dan party. I didn't sleep very well that night. <laughs> and my my phone is in near Killeen, Texas. I'm in Austin. I have a panel the next day. I have a presentation the next day, and I'm like, Welp, I need to sleep. I need to wake up early, and I'll sort it out at some point. Thankfully, my sister lives in Killeen. So I finally get a hold of the driver, and he's like, yeah, man, I have, you know, I have your phone, and I drove around the neighborhood a couple of times, and I didn't see you, so I just went home. And, but I'm here. I'm going to be here the whole day. This is the last day of the, of the conference. And my sister wanted to meet out for dinner. So she was driving, like, she was, like, 20 minutes away from, from Austin. And I go, uh, Dulce, uh, my phone is actually in Killeen. So she was like, oh, no problem. The, her, her husband, and uh, Jacob, my nephew, you know, picked me up. And then we drove back to Killeen, picked up my phone. They drove me back to Austin. We had dinner. And then she still had to go back home. So she saved a week 
my credit cards and my ID are right on my phone. So I don't know how it would have gotten into the airport. But man, you know, uh, these conferences, they, they really do something to you. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, and, and you know, that is quite the story. If, if I seemed a little bit out of it on Sunday morning, you know, I do apologize. Come talk to me, uh, you know, next time and just, you know, make fun of me or, or something. You know, I think Daryl Edwards <laughs> told me that I was Muppet of the Year for doing that. <laughs> yeah, man, but, uh, you know, overall, you know, love Paleo Effects, you know, uh, tons of fun, tons of community. And then, you know, I got to present in some really cool panels and talk to people and really help people, hopefully. And uh, I can't wait for next year. Awesome. Awesome, dude. I'll talk to you soon. Good chatting with you. Have a good one.